I want to welcome you to today's training, Brain-Based Strategies for Teaching Children with High-Functioning Autism. This training is hosted by Florida Atlantic University's Center for Autism and Related Disability, or FAU CARD, and Partnerships for Effective Programs for Students with Autism, otherwise known as PEPSA. FAU CARD is a legislative discretionary project whose mission is to provide expert consulting, training, and support for individuals who have autism and related disabilities, their families, the community, and the professionals that serve them. All of our services are completely free of charge. There are seven centers for autism and related disabilities throughout the state of Florida, covering all 67 counties. FAU CARD serves five counties, Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, Okeechobee, and Indian River counties. Clinical support specialists work both in the field and out of our three offices located on FAU CARD's main, FAU's main campus in Boca Raton, the John D. MacArthur campus in Jupiter, and the Pruitt campus of Indian River State College at St. Lucie West. My name is Rosie Portera. I am a pediatric speech language pathologist and an FAU CARD clinical specialist who serves Martin and Okeechobee counties. I have spent most of my career developing and implementing programs for children with moderate to severe disabilities and autism. 11 years ago, I decided to go out from behind, get out from behind my administrator's desk and see if I still had it. And I went back into the trenches as a speech language pathologist working for my local school district. On my caseload were two self-contained ASD classrooms. Most of the kids in there were very high functioning, but by October of my first year, my first semester, I had been through so three social skills curriculums and frankly did not see how they could possibly be effective in teaching children with ASD the nuances necessary for social success. It was then that I attended my first social thinking conference. This methodology spoke to me in many ways. It targeted the neurologic processes that makes us all social being, the social beings that we are, provided me an abundance of resources to support my growth as a clinician and just made sense. Today's presentation is a combination of my own social thinking trainings, which have been many, and the social thinking Bible, thinking about you, thinking about me, written by Michelle Garcia Winner, a speech language pathologist and the founder of social thinking. So let's get started. Autism is a neurologically based disability present from birth that impacts both social development, language and communication skills and presents a variety uh, can present a variety of res restricted or repetitive interests and behaviors. It's very complex and looks differently from individual to individual. Here are a few points to understand before we move on. Receptive and expressive language abilities do not equal communication abilities. During a language assessment, many individuals with high functioning autism will fall well within normal limits. It's easy to assume that if a child has the ability to understand and formulate language, they have the skills necessary to be a successful communicator. However, Communication is dependent not only on the technical knowledge of language, but the person's ability to use language in a socially meaningful way. It's what speech language pathologists call pragmatic language skills. Also, being social is not something anyone had to teach us. We were born hardwired to be social. The bonding we have at birth quickly evolves into the nonverbal child caregiver dance that gets our physical and emotional needs met. There are three primary neurologic foundations that make up the disability of autism. <clears throat> the first is central coherence theory, the next executive functioning, and the third theory of mind. The central coherence theory is the ability to understand how pieces of information are related to each other to fully understand a concept as a whole. It's big picture thinking. 
This is how we take in the information from our environment and put it into categories. It's the foundation of learning. It's our ability to generalize information that we've learned, like when a toddler learns their colors and when they're out with their mom will spontaneously say, it's a blue car, I want a red balloon, or look at the yellow duck. It helps to take a long-term goal like writing a research paper or planning on going to college and breaking down those steps into doable increments so that we can be success, successful. If we look at the big picture of how many steps they are, it's easy to get overwhelmed and feel like we can't achieve it. It allows us to build also on the prior knowledge that we have and when we learn something new so that we can relate what we already know and expand our learning experience. I think of it as um, like math, when we learn math. First we learn our numbers, then we learn addition and subtraction, and then multiplication and division. When we get to multiplication, we don't have to relearn our numbers. It's already in there, it's information that, we've already, that we already know. Let me give you another example. Let's say you go to the grocery store and you see this strange looking fruit. Let me move that out of the way. You don't know what it is. You've never seen it before. So you're curious, it's something novel. You go over, you pick it up and you immediately start thinking, hmm, well, let's see, it's about the size of an avocado, maybe the color of a mango. And you decide, I'm gonna take this thing home and try and learn more about it. When you take it home, you cut it open because you want the full sensory experience here. You look at it, it's like nothing you've ever seen. It's kind of green like a cucumber and maybe it has a little bit of a taste like a cucumber as well. So the next thing you do is Google it. You Google it and find out that the name for this is a horned melon, a spiked melon, an African jelly melon, or a spiked cucumber. What you learn is that the riper it gets, the more it tastes like a banana and it grows on a vine. So if you want to share this new experience with your family, you might look up some recipes and make something out of this to share the whole experience. This really moves what you've learned from short term to your long term memory. And that central coherence, you don't have to think about it, it just happens automatically. Children with central coherence deficits have a conceptual learning disability. They have limited neurologic channels to integrate and organize information, which will impact a number of areas. Kids with ASD have lots of data in their heads, but have limited channels to integrate and organize that data. A deficit with central coherence impacts effective communication, summarizing, recognizing expectation, and written expression. Children with autism tend to think in parts and don't understand how the parts relate to each other. They have limited ability to understand context or to see the big picture. We can also see central coherence deficits in children with learning disabilities. So you can have a deficit in central coherence theory and not have autism, but these deficits are often seen to some degree in children with autism spectrum disorders. But remember, central coherence deficits are on their own continuum. Some kids do really well with this and some kids have some real challenges. The next area, neurologic function, is executive functioning. Executive functioning skills are the core set of cognitive skills required for com planning, completing, and evaluating the completion of tasks, as well as overseeing our verbal and nonverbal communication exchanges. I think of executive functioning as the air traffic controller of my brain. It's always on, it's always monitoring my environment. It helps me stay focused. Typically when I meet with families, I will meet with them at Dunkin' Donuts or Panera Bread, and I have a lot of information to share with them and learn from them. I have good executive functioning skills. So I'm able to stay focused even though outside the window there may be cars flying by, I may hear kitchen noises, there might be people walking by with different kinds of aromas. I'm able to stay on task and focused on what I'm talking about. 
It helps me keep organized and prioritize my tasks. It also helps us set up long-term goals like central coherence, but our executive functioning recognizes when we deviate from the path to accomplishing that goal and it helps us problem solve our way back on track. It's also our ability to manage time. If I were to give you a 30 question quiz and 30 minutes to do it, somewhere around minute 14 to 17, you're going to look up at the clock. You're gonna check in. You have to figure out, am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Will I have time to check my answers? I think all of us probably have someone in our life who can never find their keys and wallet. So you can have executive functioning deficits and not necessarily be autistic. There are two levels of executive functioning. The lower, level, um, of, is, the lower level of cognitive skills controls behavior. I think of these as really immature executive functioning skills. Think of the toddler who has short attention spans, needs motivation to learn something or complete something, and has those terrible twos where so emotional regulation can uh, be challenging at times. The higher level cognitive skills guide behavior. These are really important. People with deficits in executive functioning um, have difficulty learning complex skills like managing homework and multiple assignments, school projects, and, and appreciating the perspective of others, basically all necessary for independence. You can see that without good executive functioning, none of us would ever complete college. The last care category, or the last neurologic process, is theory of mind or perspective taking. It's the ability to intuitively track what others know and think during personal interaction, understand that information, and monitor our own responses both verbally and non-verbally. This is where the bottom falls out for kids on the autism spectrum. It's our ability to know that you have different thoughts and feelings than I do. And if I change my behavior, I can change your thoughts and feeling. It's a skill that we hone. It's a skill that we hone um, in our preschool years when we're playing and doing imaginary play. Say we're playing house. Someone's the mommy, someone's the daddy, someone's the baby. If the child who's pretending to be the baby starts walking and talking like a five-year-old, they're not sticking to the plan and the game is over. Or if we're playing cowboys and you hand me a broom and you tell me it's a horse and I don't have enough flexible thinking to pretend that this is a horse and that a broom can be used for anything besides sweeping the floor, the floor you're not gonna wanna play with me. As we get older, it's understanding how to get in and out of conversations with others and leave them with good thoughts for us. And what's really interesting, I mean, we've all been in a situation where maybe you're at church or you're going to a large meeting and you see someone you know kind of across the room who waves at you or, or is close to you and motions you to sit down. You're gonna spend some time making them feel good, giving them some good language and thoughts, and then find a way to kind of avoid spending the rest of your time with them. It's perfectly natural. And what you've done is left them with good thoughts. So everybody feels good and you can move on. It's a way that we can make and maintain friendships. So this is the Sally Ann test, also known as the false belief test. Um, it, it, it just demonstrates a child's ability to understand a person's perspective. I'm going to play that. The classic test for mind reading is called the Sally Ann. It's a test that normal kids are expected to pass when they're five years old. Like to go right. Okay, this is Sally and this is Anne. Which one's Sally? Well done, Ray. And Sally has got a basket. And Anne has got a box. And Sally has got a marble. And Sally puts her marble into her basket to keep it safe 
while she goes outside to play. But while Sally's outside, naughty Anne moves the marble from Sally's basket into her box. Naughty Anne. So where's the marble now? Good. Where did Sally put the marble in the beginning? Basket. In the basket. Well done. So when Sally comes back from playtime, where will she look for her marble? Robert should have said the basket, because that is where Sally, in her ignorance, would have thought it was. He hasn't mind-read the situation from her point of view. What is it about the autistic brain, which means that children like Robert may never be able to mind-read like the rest of us? So perspective-taking deficits do not affect academics, but have a dramatic effect on virtually every form of interpersonal interaction. Tons of work with students needs to be done to develop these skills in this area. Just like central coherence and executive functioning, perspective taking falls along its own continuum. Clinically based functional assessments are limited. Theory of mind and perspective take it, taking is the main focus of social thinking interventions. Michelle Garcia Winner believes that the deficits in perspective taking skills accounts for, mo for, the, for the most of the significant challenges faced by students with social cognitive deficits. She wants you to consider defining social skills this way. The ability to adapt your behavior effectively based on the situation and what you know about the people in the situation for them to react and respond to you in the way you had hoped. We've all been in situations where maybe we are talking to someone we're not that familiar with and we may say something that they would have an opposing view on or give you a look like, oh, I don't like what you said. We have to work very hard using our language to try and find some common ground to make sure that we leave that person thinking really good thoughts about us. Historically, Clinicians have tried to measure social skills based on a person's ability to maintain a topic, make eye contact, and demonstrate conversational turn taking. When I started at the district, I inherited many of these kind of goals where the child will, will, will maintain eye contact for 80% of the time. First of all, I don't know how to measure that. And second of all, Nobody maintains eye contact at that high a percentage. Our eye contact is fleeting, but we do maintain it to stay connected with people. The roots of social skill have more to do with a person's ability to adapt socially and interpret others' thoughts and wants. You know, it's often stated that nonverbal communication makes up 95, 90% of, of language. As a speech pathologist, I always found that as odd. But, but once I really got into the social thinking stuff, I learned that, that understanding nonverbal communication is so much more than happy face, sad face, mad face. It goes beyond just interacting with others. It's the ability to share space and to pick up cubes in our environment that give us guidance on what we should be doing. I mean, think about what it feels like when you're in a quiet movie theater and you're unwrapping a really loud candy wrapper. You're very conscious of hurry up and hurry up and unwrap it because you might be disturbing other people. Or like if you go to an airport and you've been to airports before, and you know you have a certain prior knowledge. You know there's going to be a big board in there that's going to talk about uh, arriving flights and departing flights. Uh, there's going to be a, queue, a line to get in, to queue up in, to let up, to let your to drop off your um, luggage. So we pull from prior knowledge, but we're constantly thinking with our eyes, observing how other people are acting, which gives us a clue how to act. So perspective taking, central coherence, and executive function are synergistic cognitive processes 
A weakness in one leads to some dis degree of dysfunction in the other, in the others. They are interrelated, but please do remember, children with autism are very varied. They have a lot of variety in them, and each of these neurologic components are on their own continuum. Michelle Garcia Winner um, developed the I Laugh model, and it is an acronym for a collection of impairments. Um, neurotypical students may exhibit some weaknesses addressed in the I Laugh model. I mean, we all have friends that are really disorganized or, you know, uh, have a hard time uh, achieving goals in a timely manner, uh, but they're, they're neurotypical and this does not interfere at all with their ability to have a successful um, life and establish successful relationships. Um, but for typical neurotypicals, their challenges don't necessarily constitute the severity seen with students on the autism spectrum. With that in mind, note that each student is an individual, again, and areas of weakness should be looked at as red flags that can be mitigated using targeted strategies. The ILAF model can help educators organize and describe observable behaviors as they relate to social cognition. A diagnosis of autism does little to support the individual unless we can identify the areas of deficit and implement the right intervention to meet the student's needs. So often when I had a child who came to me um, with a diagnosis of autism, if I didn't have a really well done psychoeducational that looked at all of these aspects, just saying a child has autism doesn't really give me the ability that I need to establish goals and to know what my intervention is going to look like. Okay, the first letter is I and it stands for poor initiation of communication or action. These kids don't know how to start interaction. It always amazes me. I mean, I can give them all sorts of prompts, use all sorts of communicative temptations, and they really, really need to be walked into how do I start a conversation, a project, um, anything like that. They don't ask for help, and they often struggle to begin a task. These are also our prompt-dependent kids. <clears throat> In groups, they may not participate or they're the ones telling everybody what to do. It's their inability to participate, contribute, and negotiate the flow of a discussion that prevents them from interacting efficient, effectively or pushes them to try and control the group. <clears throat> so what do we do? We have to literally teach clear initiation responses like, if they're in a group, you would have to teach the child to, to initiate by saying, I have an idea, or here's something else we could do. Create an expectation by setting a requirement for the child. Like, after we read the story, I'm going to ask questions about which character you liked. I want you to raise your hand and share one thing about one of the characters in the story. You can create a routine, like teaching a child to approach a teacher after lunch and start a conversation by asking what they had for lunch that day. Social stories and scripting can also offer the child a blueprint of how to start a task or ask a question. <clears throat> One strategy that can be very effective from social thinking is the I need help card. As educators, it's important for students to share if they understand or don't understand what we are teaching. We don't want gaps in learning. When kids don't know what to do, they don't know how to ask for help. Now, this could be because of anxiety or it could just be because they have a hard time initiating. Raising your hand to ask for a question can provoke a lot of concern for a child with autism. Um, and and maybe they just can't figure out how to, what to ask. They know they're not getting it, but they don't know what they're not getting. This may trigger a total shutdown with the child or disruptive behaviors. This is an example of a strategy card for them to reference. You give the child the card 
And whenever he has a question or he feels lost, he can just place the card on, the top, on top of his desk. This indicates to the teacher that the child needs help and it can break it down in a way so the child can indicate, I need help on all of it, most of it, or just part of it. The L is listening with your eyes and brain. <clears throat> Children on the spectrum typically have weak auditory processing skills. Processing information given solely auditorily can be very challenging. Although they tend to be visual learners, they do not use their eyes to read the room or others' reactions, which contributes to their poor prediction skills. Their poor sustained eye contact diminishes their understanding of the total communication message, not only for them, but it also contributes to others perceiving them as odd. Consequently, they often miss signals from others and tend to perseverate on topics and interests. So what to do? When teaching, you'll need to break inf information into smaller parts to increase attention. Use visuals and multi-sensory teaching to reduce auditory overload and increase comprehension. Check comprehension often by asking them to what, re repeat what they've learned or what, the, what direction they've received and things they have to do. Have them write out or draw a picture of the ex at their expectation of a task that they're supposed to do or, a, or a, something that they have learned. So um, I told you that I, I, you know, I went to my first uh, social thinking conference and I came back armed with all these great strategies. This was the first thing that I did. I placed these little blocks all around the front of the room. There were, again, um, this particular classroom had kindergarten to second graders. It was self-contained. The kids were high functioning. Um, they all had uh, language skills. They all used language to communicate. And I said to them, we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna look at a block. And I want you to get the block I'm looking at. I looked back at the children and they all looked at me like I had two heads. They had no idea what I was talking about. So I gathered up my cute little one inch colorful blocks and we went to the back of the classroom, sat on the floor in a semicircle in closer proximity to both me and the blocks. I looked at a little girl, I looked at a block to the left of me, and with great confidence, she got up and picked up the block right in front of me. I looked at a little boy, I looked at a block to the right front of me with great confidence. He got up, picked up the block way over to the far right of me. I looked at the teacher and she was like, what is that? And I said, I got it. Now I know where to start with them. They don't think with their eyes. So based on the Thinking About You, Thinking About Me book, I created a lesson which started off teaching thinking with your eyes. And I started, these are the parts of the eyes, the iris, the whites, and, and that when, when our pupil is looking at something, when our eyes are focused on something, um, it's like our eyes are like arrows. We're shooting in that direction. So I started on my Promethean board, driving these, um, drawing these, these eyes, and one by one, the kids would come up, the kids would come up and draw arrows in the direction that the eyes were pointing in. We did this a lot. Everybody had a multiple chances and opportunities. Then I went to photographs, did lots of that. Then we, then we tried it with each other. We, um, we put, uh, I gave each child three blocks and a partner and they would take turns looking at each other, um, looking at a block and the other child identifying which block they were looking at. So I emphasize that your eyes are like arrows. And the other part of that is your eyes are like arrows. What you're looking at is probably what you're thinking about. So we would do things like I would look at different items in the in the room, they would guess, 
that's my Maggie. <laughs> they would guess, uh, it's okay. Maggie, it's okay, sorry. Honey girl. <sighs> sorry, I locked my husband out. Sorry. It's okay. All right, so what we would do is play these games where I would look at things and they would ask, and I would ask them, what am I looking at? What do you think I'm thinking about? And for instance, I'd look at the clock as we're getting close to lunchtime. And they'd say, I'm, you're looking at the clock. And I'd say, why do you think I'm looking at the clock? Well, it's almost lunchtime. So you're probably almost done. So it was really, really helpful. And really within a few sessions, the children did a great job of identifying um, you know, the, your eyes are our arrows, what I'm looking at, um, I'm thinking about. Whole body listening is something else that is, is just seems so simple, but our children with autism miss it. Um, we teach students that uh, to do whole body listening means our eyes are looking forward, our ears are ready to hear, our mouth, hands, and feet are quiet, our body is facing towards the speaker, meaning your shoulders are squared off to the, to the teacher. Remember, nobody ever had to teach us this. We just knew this. Your brain is thinking about what's being said and your heart is thinking about the speaker. And you know, just a simple thing like teaching children to turn their bodies towards the group or toward who they're talking about immediately makes them look like they are fitting in and they are part of the group. Just something that simple. <clears throat> um, abstract and inferential um, is a very, very challenging. It presents difficulty in understanding abstract concepts and the ability to infer meaning. These shortfalls stem from deficits in their central coherence theory. Without visual support, a child with ASD will be limited in their ability to infer meanings from books, teachers, lectures, or conversation. Abstract and inferential skills are required for generalizations, abstract ideas, and deeper meanings. Like looking at a sequence and identifying what comes next or understanding that the Liberty Bell is not just a relic from American history, but it's also a symbol of freedom. Their literal interpretation of language and communication can provoke odd responses sometimes because students have difficulty interpreting language, especially like idioms and metaphors. Communication is so abstract. Facial expressions, body language, tone, vocal inflection, verbal communication disappears as soon as it's said. And don't forget, you have to process all this information in an instant. Allow students to do picture walks through books prior to reading a story. This will give them an idea about the theme and characters in the story. Have them do an image, have them do an image search to visualize the story's setting or the era the story takes place in. This will put pictures in their brains. Make a list of all the steps required for an assignment and teach them to refer often to the list and check off tasks as they complete them. When introducing a subject, ask the student to tell you everything you know about the subject before you start the lesson. This will help them capture any prior knowledge they have and will serve as transitional information that the story can then build on. Provide opportunities for the student to act out or draw out elements of the story. And remember to utilize your speech language pathologists and learning specialists and have them help you implement teaching strategies used with children who have learning disabilities. These are some of the tools um, that we often use. Um, visuals are so, so important. You know, I often give the example of kids with autism have a really difficult time thinking, thinking in pictures, especially younger children. So I want you to think about um, if you are going to the grocery store for a carton of eggs, if that's all you're going for, the second you cross that threshold, you have a picture in your head of where it is in the store, what aisle it's on, 
maybe even the items around it. Having pictures in our head really help us maneuver the world. So using visuals um, for kids with autism really help give them a guide of what they're supposed to be doing and it also supports independence. This is an activity um, that I would do with my kids. I would have a, literally a, a box that was yellow. And um, I'll tell you, I could never go down any hall without typically neurotypical kids being like, what's in the box? I wanna see in the box, is that a present for me? Um, so it automatically creates a lot of interests. Interest. Now we know our kids on the spectrum have a difficult time um, you know, making guesses, they hate making guesses, they hate inferences, they just really struggle with that kind of stuff. So before I started my lesson, which was, which were always theme-based, much like your lessons are theme-based, I would put an object in the box and I would say, what's in the box? What's in today's box is a clue about today's story. And usually during the first part of the year or until they really get some attributes um, pretty well, because remember, I'm a speech language pathologist, so I'm trying to build these language concepts. Um, I might peek into the box and say, hmm, it's red. It's round. Ooh, I want you to get a picture in your mind about what you think is in the box. Hmm, it's something we eat. It's crunchy. And then usually kids, you know, does anybody have a guess? I mean, the whole time that I'm giving different kind of attributes, um, the kids are, are guessing. On um, the second part of the year, I make the children ask the questions. What color is it? What shape is it? Can, is it something you can eat? So that we're building some of those language skills. So obviously that is an apple. This really helps children, um, oopsie, it really helps children build some of those skills, those guessing skills that, that they are often very challenged by. <clears throat> These are some um, programs that really support comprehension. Um, the I Get It book is um, written, uh, it's, it's a social thinking um, book that really is full of great strategies and activities to help children build some foundation in comprehension. Um, many people are familiar with Story Grammar Marker. I mean, it's nice because it's something that's interactive. It's something you can manipulate. One of my favorite tools is the expansion expression school um, tool by Sarah Smith. Uh, this is a multi-sensory approach to expand vocabulary um, and language. Uh, literally the tools that are offered in this um, in this pack uh, can go from pre-k all the way up to writing prompts well through high school. It really helps children learn different aspects of developing a story, of writing a story, and how to share information. <clears throat> the U is understanding perspective. This will be, this, this will affect their ability, oh, let me read it first. Difficulty recognizing and incorporating an other person's perspective to regulate social relationships or just share space effectively. This will affect their ability to understand how characters relate to each other in literature. Remember the Sally Ann test? If two characters in the story know something a third character doesn't, this can cause a lot of confusion and misinterpretation for the student. Lack of perspective taking skills in children with ASD can also lead to challenging behaviors. Poor observation of peers diminishes their ability to self-regulate their behavior according to the needs of others. Behaviors can range from outbursts, eloping from the classroom, aggression, meltdowns, or total shutdowns. Oftentimes, you know, it's that quiet child with ASD that's sitting there not making any kind of noise that is missing everything, but because they're not acting out, the teacher isn't aware that they aren't getting it or they're really missing cues. I was called to do an observation in a uh, second grade class. This little girl was making her teacher crazy. She would not stay in her seat. 
She was probably the brightest kid in the classroom too. I entered the class during, or I, I observed during a math, uh, math class. Um, the teacher had put the child on a computer because what the teacher was teaching was, um, the student was well beyond that, so she was doing her own thing. <clears throat> of course, she finished her computer program while the class was still going on and got up and started moving around the room, poking kids, trying to get attention. I gave her kind of a look and she came over to me and I said to her, you're the only one standing. And she looked around. She said, no, I'm not. She's standing, pointing to the teacher. Okay, I chuckled a little and I said, you're right, but you're the only student standing. She looked around again, got this surprised look on her face and quickly put her bottom down in her desk. So her inability to really perceive and, and figure out what she's supposed to be doing based on what her classmates were doing um, was something that obviously I recommended that we start targeting those skills. So what to do? To facilitate friendships, um, we have to help the child understand how their actions affect others. Um, using visual reports, like you can even draw stick finger figures, especially if a child has a conflict, it is a wonderful opportunity to help them figure out where they miscommunicated or when, where they, they sent signals that, um, that made the other child upset or, you know, maybe they were obnoxious and they got on the child's um, nerves. So using stick figures or thought bubbles of, yeah, this is what you said, but this is what the other person was thinking really helps children with autism understand that other people have different thoughts and feelings than they do. Teaching the child to identify their frustration and feelings of being overwhelmed early enough to implement some calming strategies will help them learn how to self-regulate and to communicate their needs effectively and honestly can avoid um, lots of behavior issues. So teaching them skills to recognize when they're starting to get anxious and some strategies to help them decrease those things or to refocus um, is, is, is something that, that the children can absolutely learn and be super helpful. And then in comes our Superflex. This is a um, curriculum from um, socialthinking.com. Superflex uh, is our superhero, and he teaches kids to be flexible thinkers. Through a series of comic book characters, Superflex teaches children the strategies they need to support compliance, self-regulation, focus, and getting along with others. These books introduce, there, there's a variety of books that they have, and they introduce characters that represent the behaviors typically seen in children with autism. These characteristics are called the unthinkables. They invade our brains and make us lose perspective or the ability to control our behavior. Like rock brain, who has trouble transitioning from a preferred activity, or glass man, who shatters when things don't go his way, or one-sided Sid, who only likes to talk about things that are interesting to him. And there are so many more um, unthinkables. And, and, and with each unthinkable, um, there is a story that Superflex shares strategies for how to defeat these unthinkables. I really love the concept of Superflex because it made the issues each child was experiencing nameable and, and practicing Superflex strategies gave the, child, the children control. I began, I began my lesson of introducing um, Superflex by giving each child their own paper with all the unthinkables on it. Over the next few les lessons, I would introduce each unthinkable and ask the child to circle the character if they felt it was an unthinkable that sometimes invaded their brains. And frankly, we all have unthinkables that invade our brains. It's just we can do a cognitive override because we know what the expect expected behavior is. 
This allowed me, I could collect these sheets, it allowed me to develop individualized goals for each student to target the, the needs that they say that they have. <clears throat> the G stands for Gestalt Processing or Getting the Big Picture. Students will attend to details, but miss the underlying concept of the assignment, story, or conversation. They have challenges in identifying the similarities in a group and how things relate to each other. Their writing can be all over the place sometimes. Um, you know, like if a teacher asks a, you know, does a lesson, asks the child to write uh, a few sentences on what they learned, the first sentences, sentence may be on top topic or the first paragraph may be on topic. The middle part of, the, of their writing is totally off topic. It's gone off in another direction because they got a thought in their head and off they went. And oftentimes they end trying to bring the topic back in, but it often um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So being able to help children organize their writing is a huge aspect um, of this. Let me give you an example of big picture thinking. So the teacher says, okay, students, get ready for a spelling test, all right? So the students in the class get out a piece of paper, fold it in half, number down the side, put the name and date on it. They're ready to take the test. Child with autism just sits there. Now, can he take the spelling test and pass it? Probably. But he doesn't understand that there are certain steps that have to take place for, um, for you to be able to take a spelling test. So these are kids that become very prompt dependent. You know, you've got your teacher saying, get out your paper, get out your pencil, fold it in half. So each step has to be prompted. <clears throat> so what to do? These students, <clears throat> it's important to remember that children with autism processes, process information more efficiently and effectively when presented with visuals. Graphic organizers can help this a lot to break down the information. You break it down for the child and then you help them see how each part relates to each other. Teach overtly how to discern the parts of the story or steps of a task. Help them do task analysis and monitor their progress to completion. So it's really important when you start um, by maybe giving them a list of things to do that they need to check off to just kind of waltz by every once in a while and make sure they're still on task. You may have to cue them to do it and you may need to set up a reward system so that they are motivated to, um, do, to follow the tasks. Um, you can also Google self-regulated writing strategies. There's tons of different kinds of um, graphic organizers that you can choose from for pretty much any lesson. <clears throat> H is humor and human relatedness. <clears throat> Students may have a great sense of humor, but miss the subtleties of humor. May not understand if they're being laughed at or laughed with. This causes difficulties, a lot of difficulties in relating to others. These students respond well to teachers who have a more relaxed and humorous teaching style, but adhere to a very structured classroom routine. So they like the flexibility that the teacher offers, but the teacher's class gives them a lot of predictability. <clears throat> students, students may produce inappropriate humor in the class in an attempt to engage with others, or if kids laugh at them once about something they say, they may say it over and over and over again. And of course that becomes obnoxious and at some point the teacher has to intervene. So unfortunately, many of these characteristics may also attract bullies. So what to do? <clears throat> what to do? Teach that humor has a time and place. Differentiate friendly teasing from mean-spirited teasing. Incorporate, right? 
Incorporate anti-teasing programs into, into the classroom and school. Be aware that bullying occurs during non the non-instructional parts of the school day, like recess, lunch, bathroom breaks, and even just standing in line. Bullying can have long-term mental health consequences for a child with autism spectrum disorders. Their perceptual deficits make it difficult to understand and avoid situations where they can be taken advantage of and teased or bullied. I'm gonna pause right here before I go on to my final slides and, and let you all know that to obtain a certificate of completion for this PEPSA event, you must fill out a form at the certificate of completion link indicated on the email for this training. Please write down this code. It is required to receive your certificate. R P V one zero two zero two one. The code is R P V one zero two zero two one. That way you can get your certificate. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stanley Greenspan a per said, a person needs to be able to relate effectively before they can grow cognitively. Don't you find that to be true? Wasn't your favorite teacher the one you were most eager to learn from? Take the time to build a rapport with your students. Embrace their uniqueness. They will learn more from you if they like you. Socialthinking.com offers a huge collection of resources, like I said before, um, products as well as free articles and resources um, for you to learn more about um, cognitive, social cognitive um, issue, issues. Um, Obviously, Thinking About You, Thinking About Me is considered the Bible and um, really the foundation for everything else that they do. The Social Explorers curriculum um, is uh, for pre-K through about second grade, and they, um, <clears throat> there are individual books and curriculum that teach kids some foundation social thinking skills, like how to be, stay in the group, how to stick to a plan, how to think with your eyes, many, many more. They've also put out a second series of curriculum on this, and they have a music CD that goes along with it. So it can be really um, multi-sensory. You Are a Social Detective is a great book to start with. And I usually do start this when I'm trying to introduce um, these concepts with teachers because it talks about we all have science brains and social brains. It goes over the vocabulary that you're going to be using for social thinking, not just for the teachers, but also the students. This is a book for students, but it's kind of my quick, dirty way to teach and get everybody on the same page, you know, the same social thinking um, kind of train. It, it really does help uh, anyone really understand uh, what the goal is and um, how to get there. <clears throat> um, it offer, we, there's also a Superflex curriculum and there's a number of books um, that highlight Superflex's interaction with many of the unthinkables. They have lots of different kinds of posters. Um, the Think Social is their curriculum and this is a curriculum that um, that really uh, can start at four years of age and go up to adulthood. Lots of activities to kind of uh, help you develop perspective taking skills with children and, uh, you know, really helpful. You don't have to like create the stuff um, on your own. <clears throat> um, often high functioning students will improve academically at the point where teachers feel they may no longer be autistic. But take the whole child into account. Remember, people, <clears throat> people don't get jobs and have happy relationships because the world is so impressed by their GPA. Ask yourself, how well is this child able to get along with others? Are they making friends? Are they demonstrating the flexibility required to sustain relationships with their same age peers? 
social thinking can really help us along the way. It really did change um, my therapeutic approach with the students um, that I worked with, and it's certainly come in handy now that I work for FAU CARD. This is my contact information. Um, if you have any questions about any of the content that I went over today or the resources that I've shared or want to learn more, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to assist any way that I can. And thank you for attending this PEPSA event um, and this FAU card uh, training event. Uh, you can con There's our contact information and I hope that everybody has a lovely day. Thanks a lot, bye.